We're going to move into the question and answer session, but just before I do, I'm just going to pass over to our single panel member tonight to introduce herself as well. Evening, everyone. Um, my name's Nikki Goss. I'm from the Canterbury Earthquake Temporary Accommodation Service. We have three streams to our service, the first being the temporary accommodation, so we can assist people to find suitable temporary accommodation whilst have to be out of your property. We also manage the temporary villages that the government put in place following the earthquakes. The second stream is the temporary accommodation allowance fund. Uh, it's a financial package the government put in place for when your insurance assistance for your temporary accommodation is exhausted. So if you're out of your home for a period of time, that money doesn't last a long time. Um, so that is in place and has just recently been, the program's been extended from the end of October this year through to 31 December 2017. So that's a, a comfort for a lot of people. Um, the third service that we are involved in is the Earthquake Support Coordination Service. is a collaboration of government and non-government agencies to support homeowners through complex situations of which multi-unit buildings is one, as we've all heard tonight. Uh, a coordinator will work alongside you, visit you where it suits you. It's a free service. They can be an extra ear at meetings, take notes for you, just um, ensuring that the right messages have been heard, link you to the right people at the right agency. So just ensuring that the time you've got to spend is spent on the things that are going to make a difference for you. So we have a full-time coordinator here at the Hub. You can come in and see her at any stage, and she'll um, connect you with one of approximately 40 staff that we've got at the moment. We've got currently got 1,100 current clients, and we've seen just over 9,900 since the earthquake. So done, so helps support a lot of people. Um, and there's three of us here tonight that you can talk to afterwards if you like, or there's a website and some details that you can take away. Great, thank you very much, Nikki. So I'm going to um, get Nathan to come and grab the microphone. And uh, he's going to start at the back row. And so you can just signal to him if you have a question, and he'll hand the microphone to you. Go ahead. Hi. Um, can either one of the two um, panel members tell us what caused a multi-year delay in the processing of claims for multi-unit dwellings and is there uh, any comeback for owners of multi-unit dwellings that have subs uh, subsequently suffered additional damage uh, since the original earthquakes? <coughs> well, um, the short answer as to why there was delay in settlement of multi-unit dwellings is that either EQC or the insurer didn't settle them. Um, but one of the factors that could have contributed to that is that the guidelines for repairing multi-unit dwellings were only available in April of 2014. So a number of insurers in EQC did just park the multi-unit dwelling claims until that information was available. Um, sorry, what was the other part of the question? Um, subsequent subsequent to the earthquakes and because of the delays in uh, repairs to multi-unit dwellings starting, uh, some units uh, and some people will have suffered uh, additional consequential damage. Is there any comeback for multi-unit dwelling owners with regards to consequential damage? In claims involving EQC, the question is whether the consequential damage is natural disaster damage. Um, so if it's not a direct cause of the earthquake, it's not natural disaster damage and not covered by the commission. If it is, then it should be covered by the commission. And with insurance policies, it's whether or not it meets the definition of damage which is in those policies. So is that something that um, uh, you would be able to advise more specifically on if somebody were to come to RAS, for example, for advice on that? Absolutely. Okay, so that might be something you'd like to do as well. Go ahead. 
Thanks. I was going to wait till the end, but uh, um, we, we've got issues where uh, different insurance companies, you've got one lead company taking over the uh, rebuild of a multi-unit dwelling. One of the insurance companies, Southern Response, won't pay out for repair to the land or land remediation if there's a cash settlement. So the other, other tenants are going to miss out significantly. Has this been struck before and where to from here? I haven't struck that before. I mean, my first thought about that is that Southern Response is liable for the house and not for the land. So land damage is something that EQC either compensates um, directly or else addresses by way of doing repairs to land. Um, so that's not something that we've struck before. Happy to discuss it afterwards. Um, you actually mentioned in the discussion around cross-lease that in dispute matters go to arbitration. Um, I'd be interested in terms of who handles arbitration in relation to disputes for cross-lease. I know that you mentioned that um, arbitration is very expensive and my research has, has looked at the Tribunals Act where Section 16.2 actually allows smaller matters to go to the Small Claims Court or to the tribunal for small claims. So I'm just wondering about your, your views on that one. The Disputes Tribunal, which is a very cheap service, is not arbitration. So um, if a memorandum says that a dispute can only be resolved by way of arbitration, then that is a process that must be followed unless all the owners agree to a variation of that. of the um, Tribunal Act was actually relevant, which allows the matter to go to small claims, as a small claim. And he actually referred to the fact that... You mean the dispute tribunal? Yeah, sorry, I am. As opposed... Yeah, that, that it was actually OK to go to the, you know, a, tri a tribunal hearing, and Section 16.2 actually has quite wide generalised powers that say that. When, when the, it says matters that normally would go to arbitration can be heard via a dispute, disputes tribunal. And the fact that the lease says that it's an arbitration matter does not prevent it going to a tribunal. That's not a question that I can answer ah. authoritatively tonight, but it's one that I could follow up and get back to you. Yeah, that would be excellent, thank you. Later. Um, Victoria's pointed out that the Disputes Tribunal does have a limit on claims, so it cannot hear claims which are greater than $15,000 currently, or $20,000 by agreement, so that could limit its application. For me, I was just looking at an earthquake issue that is a small amount, so that's why I'm looking at the confirmation that that would be a small We'll look at it and get back to you on that one, I think. Hey, um, we've already got a, a claim in process with RAS. Um, I'm, I'm involved in a body corp situation. I'm just wondering when the correspondence in regards to the committees and, and all of that sort of stuff for RAS to act on behalf of our body corp will actually be published to us. I have spoken to our our representative, and she's indicated that there is going to be correspondence coming out to us, but I just want to know what the time frame actually is. I'm actually doing that stuff. <laughs> <laughs> so um, it's nearly there. Yeah. Um, it, we just want to make sure we get it right. So because there's various um, body corporates that are in different stages. Some even haven't got a, a chairperson. So we're wanting to, our pack to encompass all, um, you know, all, all eventualities, so all, 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 all situations. So I would say two weeks at the most, you should have it. Thank you. Um, it was John with his uh, example on the board of the uh, four um, 
cross leases, uh, and you chose the third one, you happen to say that they would each have a quarter. It, it would be divided equally. What about the land? S supposing one, one of the uh, units has more land than, than the others. Is, is the land equally divided as well? Um, sorry. No, it's not. So no. in a cross lease situation, it's an undivided share often. Um, and there is, you are leasing back areas of the land. So your area that you have your house on is leased back to you as your exclusive use. Um, parts of the, dr well, the driveway is usually leased back so that you can at least get into your garage. Yes, yes. But if the garage is here and then... Um, these are only, these garages are not used by, sorry, these u garages are used only by the first two units and then the ones at the back are used by the last two units, then these people won't necessarily have rights over this part of the driveway. True. Um, similarly, there can be com common land and you might find that everyone has a, a walking track to get to the to the common land, but they won't necessarily be entitled to go over the drive all the way over the driveway to get there. It just depends on how the development's been done, and you'll find that on your unit plan. Right. Thank you. Okay. So we will um, we'll wrap it up from there. So thank you very much for attending, and thank you very much for your questions. I know this is quite a complex sort of realm, and uh, there are no really easy answers that apply generally across it because it's. Um, case can be so specific. So again, you do have um, hopefully copies of the slide presentation, which has a lot of information on it. These seminars will be posted online next week sometime, and uh, that will be available on our website. We can give that to you and you know, have some time to speak more one-to-one -one, um, with our RAS people. We also have RAS here at the Hub every day um, from Monday to Thursday, that, which is the days that we are open. So um, you can also come in during those hours and speak to a RAS person as well.